mass murder was the ultimate consequence of Hitler's ambition to create the new man. The cosmetic of the Nazi beauty cult finally found its way into the gas chamber. The killing was a biological mission, a holy tribute to pure blood. The death factories were anthropological sanitation facilities, instruments to beautify the world. I have ordered every officer to carry, besides his sword, Karl May's books on how to fight Indians. That is how they must fight the Russians. They must hide behind trees and bridges. Then leap forth for the kill. This statement by Hitler from 1942 betrays his bizarre relation to reality. Karl May was Hitler's favorite author. This German author wrote some 70 boys' books that Hitler had read as a child. Karl May wrote books about Indians and romantic adventure tales set in exotic surroundings. Richness of style and detail and a realism that evokes travel books are characteristic of his work. Descriptions of the Indians' fire-making techniques, details on weapons, clothing, and provisions. Karl May had never visited the places he wrote about, nor had he ever come in contact with foreign peoples or influences. He shared this lack of real experience with the untraveled Hitler. Even as an adult, Hitler continued to read Karl May's books. During the war, he could cite Karl May as proof that it wasn't necessary to know the desert to command troops in Africa. Hitler was well aware of Mai's lack of experience. He did not regard Mai as a garrulous adventurer, though, but rather, in all seriousness, as a fount of wisdom. He saw in Karl May a kind of armchair visionary with a clairvoyance access to distant realities. On another occasion, Hitler names May as an example of how someone with imagination and the power of insight does not need to know a certain people, even as May did not know Bedouins or Indians to know their souls better than any anthropologist who had studied them. To Hitler, Karl May was proof that one needn't travel to know the world. Hitler explicitly held the view that imagination could provide the basis for knowledge. Thus he was betrayed by his inability to distance himself from the visions that crowded in on him. This lack of critical distance was particularly obvious in one area where Hitler's experience was scanty. His assessment of unfamiliar peoples. This is typified by his attitude toward the Jews. Anti-Semitism's classical document, The Protocols of the Elders of Zion, a fake document, which purports to verify a Jewish conspiracy to rule the world, struck Hitler like a revelation while the question of its authenticity paled by comparison. The grip these ideas had on Hitler is evident in his paradoxical strategies. The more futile the war against the Allies became, the more zealously annihilation of the Jews was pursued. Despite the constant dearth of vital equipment and transportation, extermination of the Jews had the highest priority.
To understand the seeming lack of logic, one must reflect over the nature of Hitler's anti-Semitism. He saw the Jew as a subhuman, a cancer spreading itself over the world. But because the Jew had preserved his own racial purity, he was the Aryan's fiercest rival for world domination. In Hitler's imagination, a fight to the death was raging against the strongest and most dangerous of enemies. To wage war without fighting this primary enemy was unthinkable for Hitler. The more casualties the war reaped, the more important extermination of the Jews became. To Hitler, losing the war would not mean the end of Nazism. A grandiose German fall would provide inspiration to coming generations. Extermination of the Jews would enable the temporarily weakened German nation to raise itself once more from the ruins. On the night of May 30th and 31st, 1942, thousands of British bombers expelled their payloads over Cologne. For the first time, the Allies strike a deadly blow to Germany's heart. The destruction is horrible. The attack is a harbinger of the firestorms that will now plague Germany. Stalingrad, January 31st, 1943. The 6th German Army has been surrounded and destroyed. 90,000 Germans are taken prisoner. And now the whole world knows that Germany is losing the war. Konzert in einem Panzerkampfwagenwerk. In der Arbeitspause spielt das Orchester des Deutschen Opernhauses unter der Stabführung von Hans Schmidt-Isserstedt. Soviet armies are now advancing all along the front. As the German troops retreat, the SS are given still another mission. Himmler has ordered that every trace of the mass murders be eradicated. The job is to be carried out by a special unit, Sonderkommando 1005. Even as the German war machine slowly falls to pieces, Sonderkommando 1005 is occupied with the cosmetic adjustment of history. Before the Russian onslaught, the mass graves must be opened, the corpses burned, and the skeletons ground to dust in bone mills. Weeds will be sown to hide the